integrated system, starting with its own North Slope crude oil, and an efficient refinery tuned to refine only that grade of crude. It pulled its distribution system back to the West and Midwest in order to stay closer to its refinery. As a result, ARCO now dominates California with a clear price advantage that customers recognize. It will perform well enough in other ways to avoid irritating customers, but it doesn't try to keep up with the Joneses. It's focused, specialized. Only if an idea lowers ARCO's cost and thereby enhances its value proposition will the company pursue it. Could another company compete with ARCO? Of course, but it would be difficult to do so on price. For argument's sake, let's assume that ARCO has nailed down the price advantage. Some other company might decide to be the fastest gasoline retailer. Every customer will get served, pay, and depart in 60 seconds. It could build its operating model around that proposition. Its dollar price might be a little higher than Arco's, but not so much higher that it would bother customers who value time. How could a company do it? It could put its stations on easily accessible lots. It could spend R&D money on fast pump technology. Its attendants could wear computerized credit card terminals on their belts, like the ones car rental companies use. The point is that if the customer value you decide to offer is speed, the ideas automatically fall into place on how to create an operating system. The particular value that you decide to offer has the effect of defining your thinking about your business, of shaping the company's operating model. Low price, as we have seen, defines everything that Arco is and does. Once it chose to be the price leader in its market, the notion of installing computerized map machines or other gimmicks became irrelevant. The company is passionate about the one value it delivers to customers. Arco is behaving consistently with the fourth new rule for market leaders. Rule four, build a well-tuned operating model dedicated to delivering unmatched value. In a competitive marketplace, improving customer value is the market leader's imperative. The operating model is the key to raising and resetting customer expectations. Improving it can make competitors' offerings look less appealing or even shatter their position by rendering their value proposition obsolete. The operating model is the market leader's ultimate weapon in its quest for market domination. For some readers, the new rules of market leadership will be intuitively appealing. To others, they will raise stubborn questions. How can a company offer the best value proposition in the market? Read, give its products and services away, and still make money. How can a company provide better customer value every year and still make money in the long run? Won't you burn out your employees if you're never satisfied with the level of value you offer? If you're on this treadmill of ever-expanding ambition? Isn't delivering value to customers in potential conflict with delivering value to shareholders? We think not. In fact, in all market-leading companies we observed, corporations like Walmart, Southwest Air, FedEx, Glaxo, Airborne, and Intel, customer value, shareholder wealth, and employee satisfaction move in lockstep. These companies view customer value as the indispensable source of both shareholder value and employee satisfaction. Without customer value, there is no sustainable business. Some readers will ask, what's new and different in our perspective? How does it relate to accepted wisdom that learning organizations, customer loyalty, and core competencies, to name a few of today's popular notions, contain the answers to all management woes? Our conclusion is that none of these notions gets to the heart of what sustains success in a competitive marketplace. At best, they provide partial solutions. Their relevance depends entirely on whether and how well they are channeled toward the pivotal issue of increasing customer value year after year. For example, the concept of core competence is that a company succeeds by leveraging what it's good at. Honda has a core competence in small engines. It has leveraged that capability in many markets, from motorcycles and autos to lawnmowers and generators. But Briggs & Stratton has a core competence in small engines, too. Why hasn't it been as successful? The answer lies not in examining these two companies' core competencies, but by understanding that they have different value disciplines. Honda, dedicated to the value discipline of best product, has built an operating model that naturally leverages its small engine competence into new application markets. Briggs & Stratton, with a value discipline focused on best total cost, has built an operating model that channels its small engine competence toward making its engines cheaper and cheaper. Core competencies may be part of the operating model, but they aren't sufficient. They don't, like the operating model, help managers to balance the management of core and secondary processes, structure, and culture.
3M may have developed non-woven technology as a core competency, but that's not enough to make it a product leader in tapes and soap pads. Likewise, suggesting that Walmart's success stems solely from its logistics competency, or that Intel's success stems solely from its microprocessor design competency, pushes the concept of core competencies too far. Success is more multifaceted. Similarly, the pursuit of customer satisfaction and loyalty doesn't by itself create unmatched value. Value comes from choosing customers and narrowing the operations focus to best serve those customers. Customer satisfaction and loyalty are simply the byproduct of delivering on a compelling value proposition, not the drivers behind it. Those companies that wish to sail at the head of their markets must weigh anchor from a mooring secured to value, namely the value proposition. That proposition must stress just one particular kind of value that customers want. Leaders will not pursue a diffused business strategy, but must continually focus on running a tight ship where their business practices enhance the one special value that they can provide better than anyone else. Chapter 3. The Winner's Choice The salespeople from FedEx no longer knock on the door at National Parts Depot. That's because Airborne Express, the Seattle-based $1.5 billion Air Express company, stole NPD's business away from FedEx with better service. Airborne has similarly pushed its competitors aside at Xerox and at Luxottica, the Long Island-based distributor of eyeglass frames. Airborne's success at stealing business stems from many small strengths. But the big reason was its decision to deliver a different kind of value than FedEx. Whereas FedEx has chosen to create customer value through excellence of execution, Airborne has chosen to create value through excellence in customer care. The juxtaposition of FedEx and Airborne highlights what particularly struck us in our study of 80 market leaders. In the same way that customers cluster into three different categories, as mentioned in the previous chapter, companies cluster into distinctively different value disciplines. These disciplines are based not on industry, but upon what kind of value proposition the companies pursued. Best total cost, best product, or best total solution. We gave these three value disciplines, each appropriate for a different kind of customer, three distinctly different names, operational excellence, product leadership, and customer intimacy. By operational excellence, we mean providing customers with reliable products or services at competitive prices, delivered with minimal difficulty or inconvenience. By product leadership, we mean providing products that continually redefine the state of the art. And by customer intimacy, we mean selling the customer a total solution, not just a product or service. FedEx falls into the category of operational excellence. Airborne into the category of customer intimacy. Companies such as 3M, Nike, Motorola, and Sony fall into the category of product leadership. These companies have taken their leadership positions by narrowing their business focus, not broadening it. In line with the new rules of competition we set out in the prior chapter, they chose a value proposition that highlighted a particular strength. And with it, they developed a matching operating model to deliver that value. And they disciplined themselves to stick to and continually improve their combination of value proposition and operating model while resisting the temptation to broaden their scope. When a company selects and pursues one of these value disciplines, it ceases to resemble its competitors. The choice of a value discipline shapes the company's subsequent plans and decisions, coloring the entire organization from its culture to its public stance. To choose a value discipline, and hence its underlying operating model, is to define the very nature of a company. And what sets the inner workings of market leaders apart from their also-ran competitors is the sophistication and the coherence of their operating models. Operating models are made up of operating processes, business structure, management systems, and culture, all of which are synchronized to create a certain superior value. At the heart of the operating model sits not one, but a set of core processes that make or break an organization's ability to create unsurpassed value at a profit. Different value disciplines demand different operating processes. For instance, if your customers love your consistency and speed in delivering a value for the money burger, as is the case with operationally excellent McDonald's, you'd better be stellar at the core processes of product supply, expedient customer service, and demand management. At the same time, you'll fine-tune your structure to empower the people who can make a difference in producing value. 
You'll design your management systems around measuring and rewarding what's most important. And you'll make sure that your staff is indoctrinated with your specific definition of success. In the other two disciplines, the operating model revolves around different core processes. If you're a product leader, such as Sony or Johnson & Johnson, the critical processes include invention, product development, and market exploitation. If you're a customer intimate company, Home Depot, for example, or Cable & Wireless, the telecom company, you'll demonstrate superior aptitude in advisory services and in relationship management. Companies that excel in the same value discipline have remarkably similar operating models. Arco and McDonald's, for example, are strikingly similar because both pursue operational excellence. Likewise, the management systems, business structure, and culture of product leaders such as Sony and Johnson & Johnson look alike. But across two disciplines, the similarities end. Send people from Arco to Sony and they will think they are on a different planet. Even within an industry, market leaders pursuing different value disciplines, such as Walmart and Nordstrom, look completely different. Moreover, homogeneity exists only amongst the leaders in the same value discipline. Mediocre performers look pretty much like other mediocre performers in their own industries. Let's look at each of the three value disciplines. Operationally excellent companies deliver a combination of quality, price, and ease of purchase that no one else in their market can match. They are not product or service innovators, nor do they cultivate one-to-one -one relationships with their customers. They execute extraordinarily well, and their proposition to customers is guaranteed low price and or hassle-free service. Price Costco, the Kirkland, Washington, and San Diego-based chain of warehouse club stores, doesn't provide a particularly rich selection of merchandise. Only 3,500 items compared to the 50,000 or more found in competing stores. But as a customer, you don't have to spend much time deliberating over what brand of coffee or home appliance to select. Price Costco saves you that hassle by choosing for you. The company's consumer reports mentality leads to rigorous evaluation of leading brands and shrewd purchasing of just the one brand in each category that represents the best value. To add excitement to the whole shopping experience, that is, to get a customer to come again and again, new items are constantly sprinkled into the assortment to build anticipation and a value-of-the-week atmosphere, while the on-premise bakery wafts a delicious smell of fresh bread and pastry. Behind the scenes, Price Costco follows an operating model in which it buys larger quantities and negotiates better prices to pass along to customers. It also carries only items that sell well. The company's information systems track product movement and move it does. This data drives stocking decisions that optimize floor space usage. The place hums. It runs like a well-oiled machine and customers love it. Dell Computer is another master of operational excellence. Dell has shown personal computer buyers that they do not have to sacrifice quality or state-of-the-art technology to buy personal computers easily and inexpensively. In the mid-1980s, while Compaq concentrated on making its PCs cheaper and faster than IBM's, college student Michael Dell saw a chance to outdo both companies by focusing not on the product, but on the delivery system. Out of a dorm room in Austin, Texas, Dell burst onto the scene with a radically different and far more efficient model for operational excellence. Dell realized that he could outperform PC computer dealers by cutting dealers out of the distribution process altogether. By selling to customers directly, building to order rather than to inventory, integrating his company's logistics with its suppliers, and creating a disciplined, extremely low-cost culture, Dell undercut Compaq and other PC makers in price while providing high-quality products and services. Yet another, less well-known example of operational excellence is GE's white goods business, which manufactures large household appliances. It has focused on operational excellence in serving the vast market of small independent appliance retailers. In the late 1980s, GE Appliances set out to transform itself into a low-cost, no-hassle supplier to dealers. It designed its Direct Connect program in pursuit of that objective. Direct Connect requires that GE re-engineer several of its operating processes, redesign its information systems, reconfigure its management systems, and create a new mindset amongst employees. As a result, the company has lowered dealers' net cost of appliances and simplified its business transactions. Historically, the appliance industry has endorsed the theory that a loaded dealer is a loyal dealer. 
If a dealer's warehouse was full of a manufacturer's product, went the argument, the dealer would be committed to that company's product line because no room remained to stock goods from anybody else. Manufacturers' programs and pricing were built around the idea that dealers got the best price when they bought a full truckload of appliances and offered the best floor plan. But changes in retailing caused GE to question that assumption. For one, the loaded dealer concept was costly for independent appliance dealers whose very existence was threatened by the growing cloud of low-priced multi-brand chains like Circuit City. Independent stores could hardly afford to match the large stock of the chains. Moreover, the chains could put price pressure on manufacturers, causing makers' margins to reduce. Realizing that it had to supply high-quality products at competitive prices with little hassle, GE abandoned the loaded dealer concept and reinvented its operating model, the way it made, sold, and distributed appliances. Under Direct Connect, retailers no longer maintain their own inventories of major appliances. They rely instead on GE's Virtual Inventory, a computer-based logistics system that allows stores to operate as though they have hundreds of ranges and refrigerators in the back room when in fact they have none at all. With Direct Connect, retailers acquire a computer package that gives them instant access to GE's online order processing system 24 hours a day. They can use the system to check on model availability and to place orders for next day delivery. The dealers get GE's best price regardless of order size. Direct Connect dealers also get, among other benefits, priority over other dealers in delivery scheduling, plus consumer financing through GE credit with the first 90 days free of interest. In exchange, Direct Connect dealers make several commitments to sell nine major GE product categories while stocking only carry-out products such as microwave ovens and air conditioners, to ensure that GE products generate 50% of sales and to open their books for review, and to pay GE through electronic funds transfer on the 25th of the month after purchase. Under the Direct Connect system, dealers have had to give up some flow time and payables, the comfort of having their own backroom inventory and some independence from the supplier. In return, they get GE's best price while eliminating the hassle and cost of maintaining inventory and assembling full truckload orders. The result? Their profit margins on GE products have soared. Virtual inventory, it turns out, works better than real inventory for both dealers and customers. Instead of telling a customer I have two units on order, says one dealer, I can now say that we have 2,500 in our warehouse. I can also tell a customer when a model is scheduled for production and when it will be shipped. If the schedule doesn't suit the customer, the GE terminal will identify other available models and compare their features with competitive units. Meanwhile, GE gets half the dealer's business and saves about 12% of distribution and marketing costs. And since dealers serve themselves through the network, GE saves time and labor in responding to inquiries and in order entry. In fact, the Direct Connect system is the order entry process. Most important, GE has gained a valuable commodity from its dealers, data on the actual movements of its products. Most appliance manufacturers have been unable to track consumer sales accurately because they can't tell whether dealers' orders represent requests for additional inventory or actual customer purchases. With Direct Connect, GE knows that vendors' orders are actual sales to customers. GE links its order processing system to other systems involved in forecasting demand and planning production and distribution. The company now, in effect, manufactures in response to customer demand instead of to inventory. It has reduced and simplified a complex and expensive warehousing and distribution system down to 10 strategically located warehouses that can deliver appliances to 90% of the country within 24 hours. Businesses like Price Costco, Dell Computer, and GE Appliances, which have vigorously pursued a strategy of operational excellence, have built an operating model based on four distinct features. One, processes for end-to-end -end product supply and basic service that are optimized and streamlined to minimize costs and hassle. Two, operations that are standardized, simplified, tightly controlled, and centrally planned, leaving few decisions to the discretion of rank-and-file employees. Three, management systems that focus on integrated, reliable, high-speed transactions and compliance to norms. And four, a culture that abhors waste and rewards efficiency. A company pursuing product leadership continually pushes its products into the realm of the unknown, the untried, or the highly desirable. 
its practitioners concentrate on offering customers products or services that expand existing performance boundaries. A product leader's proposition to customers is best product, period. A product leader consistently strives to provide its market with leading edge products or useful new applications of existing products or services. Reaching that goal requires that they challenge themselves in three ways. First, they must be creative. More than anything else, being creative means recognizing and embracing ideas that may originate elsewhere, inside a company or out. Second, they must commercialize their ideas quickly. To do so, all their business and management processes are engineered for speed. Third, and most important, they must relentlessly pursue ways to leapfrog their own latest product or service. If anyone is going to render their technology obsolete, they prefer to do it themselves. Product leaders do not stop for self-congratulation. They are too busy raising the bar. Johnson & Johnson beats all three of these challenges. It brings in new ideas, develops them quickly, and then looks for ways to improve them. In 1983, the president of J&J's Vistacon Inc., a maker of specialty contact lenses, heard about a Copenhagen ophthalmologist who had conceived a way of manufacturing disposable contact lenses inexpensively. At the time, Vistacon generated only $20 million in annual sales, primarily from a single product, a contact lens for people with astigmatism. Vistacon's president got his tip by telephone from a J&J employee who worked for Janssen Pharmaceutical, a Belgian drug subsidiary. Instead of dismissing the ophthalmologist as a mere tinkerer, these two executives speedily bought the rights to the technology, assembled a management team to oversee development, and built a state-of-the-art facility in Florida to manufacture disposable contact lenses called AccuView. By the summer of 1987, AccuView was ready for test marketing. In less than a year, Vistacon rolled out a product across the United States with a high-visibility ad campaign. Vistacon and its parent, J&J, &J, were willing to incur high manufacturing and inventory costs before a single lens was sold. Vistacon's high-speed production facility helped give the company a six-month head start over would-be arrivals such as Bausch & Lomb and Siba Geigy. Caught off guard, the competition never caught up. Vistacon also took advantage of the benefits of decentralization, autonomous management, speed and flexibility without having to give up the resources, financial or otherwise, that only a giant corporation could provide. In 1991, Vistacon sales topped $225 million worldwide and it had captured a 25% share of the U.S. contact lens market. Part of the success resulted from directing much of the marketing effort to eye care professionals to explain how they could profit if they prescribed the new lenses. In other words, Vistacon did not market just to consumers. It said, in effect, that it's not enough to come up with a new product. You have to come up with a new way to go to market as well. J&J, &J, like other product leaders, works hard at developing an open-mindedness to new ideas. Vistacon continues to investigate new materials that would extend the wearability of the contact lenses and even some technologies that would make the lenses obsolete. Product leaders create and maintain an environment that encourages employees to bring ideas into the company and, just as important, to listen to and consider those ideas, however unconventional. Where others see glitches in their marketing plans or threats to their product lines, companies that focus on product leadership see opportunity and rush to capitalize on it. Product leaders avoid bureaucracy at all costs because it slows commercialization of their ideas. Managers make decisions quickly since, in a product leadership company, it is often better to make a wrong decision and correct it than to make a decision too late or not at all. That is why these companies are prepared to decide today, then implement tomorrow. Moreover, they continually look for new ways, such as concurrent engineering, to shorten their cycle times. Japanese companies, for example, succeed in automobile innovation because they use concurrent development processes to reduce time to market. They do not have to aim better than competitors to score more hits on the target because they can take more shots from a closer distance. Companies excelling in product leadership do not plan for every possible contingency, nor do they spend much time on upfront detailed analysis. Their strength lies in reacting to situations as they occur. Fast reaction times are an advantage when dealing with the unknown. Visticon's managers, for example, were quick to order changes to the AccuView marketing program when early market tests were not as successful as they had expected. They also responded quickly when competitors challenged the safety of the lenses. 
they distributed data combating the charges via FedEx to some 17,000 eye care professionals. Vistacon's speedy response engendered goodwill in the marketplace. Product leaders have a vested interest in protecting the entrepreneurial environment that they have created. To that end, they hire, recruit, and train employees in their own molds. When it is time for Vistacon to hire new salespeople, for example, its managers do not look for people experienced in selling contact lenses. They look for people who will fit in with J&J's culture. That means their first question isn't about a candidate's related experience. It's more likely to be, could you work cooperatively in teams? How open are you to criticism? Product leaders are their own fiercest competitors. They no sooner cross one frontier than they are scouting out the next. They have to be adept at rendering obsolete the products and services that they have created. They realize that if they don't develop a successor, another company will. J&J &J and other innovators are willing to take a long view of profitability, recognizing that extracting the full profit potential from an existing product or service is less important than maintaining product leadership and momentum. These companies are never blinded by their own successes. Not surprisingly, the operating model of the product leader is very different from that of the operationally excellent company. Its main features include 1. A focus on the core processes of invention, product development, and market exploitation. 2. A business structure that is loosely knit, ad hoc, and ever-changing to adjust to the entrepreneurial initiatives and redirections that characterize working in unexplored territory. 3. Management systems that are results-driven, that measure and reward new product success, and that don't punish the experimentation needed to get there. And four, a culture that encourages individual imagination, accomplishment, out-of-the-box thinking, and a mindset driven by the desire to create the future. A company that delivers value via customer intimacy builds bonds with customers like those between good neighbors. Customer intimate companies don't deliver what the market wants, but what a specific customer wants. The customer intimate company makes a business of knowing the people it sells to and the product and services they need. It continually tailors its products and services and does so at reasonable prices. Its proposition is, we take care of you in all your needs, or we get you the best total solution. The customer intimate company's greatest asset is, not surprisingly, its customer's loyalty. Customers don't have to be resold through expensive advertising and promotion. Customer intimate companies don't pursue transactions. They cultivate relationships. They are adept at giving the customer more than he or she expects. And by constantly upgrading their offerings, customer intimate companies stay ahead of their customers' rising expectations. Expectations that, by the way, they themselves create. Home Depot is a good example of a company that is better than most at building relationships that pay off and repeat sales from a loyal customer base. However, the high watermark for customer intimacy probably was set by IBM in the 1960s and 1970s. Customers never looked to IBM for the hottest product. In fact, IBM's response to customers who asked about leading edge technology was always, just wait 18 months and we will have that too. It was not that IBM didn't invest in product innovation, but it knew that product innovation was not the central value proposition binding customers to the company. Best price wasn't part of the company's proposition either. That was left to the plug-compatible computer makers such as Amdahl. So if IBM didn't mean best price or best technology, what did it mean? IBM was a comfort, a friend. IBM's people knew the heads of data processing, knew what their problems were, knew how to help them solve those problems and look good to their bosses. IBM assisted them with applications, planning, and technology architecture. It helped them fight for budgets and, through its executive education programs, get their bosses to appreciate technology. IBM's central value proposition was delivering a total solution in a customer-intimate fashion. Customer intimate companies consider the customer's lifetime value, not just the profit and loss on a few transactions. Their employees make sure that each customer gets exactly what he or she really wants. These companies have designed operating models that allow them to produce and deliver a much broader and deeper level of support. They tailor their mix of services or customize the products even if it means acting as a broker to obtain those services or products from third parties or co-providers. Cable and wireless communications, based in Vienna, Virginia, has worked for years to become a customer intimate organization. It is the world's largest long-distance company devoted entirely to business customers. 
Cable and Wireless attributes its 20% annual growth rate in the number of long-distance customer minutes to its striving continuously to serve its customers better than its bigger competitors, such as MCI. Cable and Wireless executives knew long ago that their long-distance operation couldn't compete on price with the big three, AT&T, MCI, and Sprint. So they sought to differentiate themselves by providing the best ongoing customer support in the industry, along with direct sales consultation that gives the sales force an intimate knowledge of what makes its customers successful. The result is that cable and wireless has turned itself from a mundane commodity business peddling long-distance service into a sophisticated telemanager, a partner with its customers. Does the customer need 800 service that routes calls, blocks calls, or captures data? Cable and wireless supplies the expertise and information systems. The product is conceived at the customer's office, says President and Chief Operating Officer Gabriel Batista. Cable and wireless pins its success on choosing the customers it can serve best, small to medium-sized businesses with monthly billings of $500 to $15,000. In such small businesses, Cable and Wireless's 500 U.S. salespeople working out of 36 regional offices can actually act like telecommunications managers. Corporations too small to hire their own telecom gurus value the advice and expertise Cable and Wireless people can offer. Cable and Wireless then goes on to segment its small to medium-sized business market vertically. By refining its market segments, it can appeal to specific customers with specialized services that no other company can begin to provide. One of its customer segments is the legal profession. Cable and Wireless is developing features and functions that have tremendous appeal to lawyers, such as innovative ways to track and segment billings of calls linked to specific client accounts. We want to sell products that fit the legal industry like a glove, says Batista. Cable and Wireless then takes the next step and fine-tunes its services to each customer. If that means something as simple as printing its bills on both sides of the paper, Cable and Wireless obliges. The company wants customers to feel they are getting the support of not just the sales force, but of the entire company. Cable and Wireless empowers all employees who work with customers to make the most sophisticated decisions possible. Pricing was once the domain of the corporate pricing gurus. No longer. Each of the 50 local managers has his or her own pool of funds to structure pricing. The same thing goes for promotional, advertising, and trade show money. The corporate center doesn't hog the budget and issue edicts. The local managers allocate money as they see fit. They prepare budgets and send them up the corporate ladder. Do cable and wireless managers run amok with so much authority? It can happen, cable and wireless executives concede, but if so, they figure that the occasional screw-up is worth it. Executives go on to audit all decisions and practices to both catch blunders and help the front lines learn from them. All of these practices help cable and wireless people build very tight relationships with customers. The result is extremely high customer retention rates. Cable and wireless loses only 2% of long-distance minutes billed each month compared to an industry standard of 3% to 5%. Of course, only through those high retention rates can the company continue to fund its high level of support. 100% of the sales force is dedicated to the dual objectives of providing ongoing help to customers and bringing in new customers. For large accounts, the company also assigns strategic support representatives to whom the customer can turn at any moment for hand-holding. Cable and Wireless also has what the company calls a retention day, during which salespeople will sit down with large accounts to go over every aspect of service. The company holds out a big carrot to keep its people focused on customer retention. It compensates its sales force based on how long a customer remains with the company. In addition, unlike competitors that pay salespeople according to the number of accounts landed in the dollars bills, cable and wireless compensates people based on their ability to retain existing accounts. Salespeople don't hesitate to suggest that customers switch to more appropriate services even if the new services bring in less money. The result once again, happier, more loyal customers. To move quickly in responding to customers, cable and wireless maintain state-of-the-art software capabilities both to customize services, such as billing, and to design and assemble its own switches. The company also operates an integrated information system so that, with a few keystrokes, anyone can bring up all pertinent information on a customer, from orders to billing. 
Cable and Wireless has worked hard in recent years to re-engineer its processes to assure greater customer intimacy than any competitor can provide. Ultimately, says Batista, we see our competitive edge as our ability to look at our customers' needs and to customize our products and services to fit these needs exactly and uniquely so they can reduce operating expenses, increase their competitive position, or become more productive. Again, the operating model of the customer intimate company is very different from that of businesses pursuing other disciplines. Its features include, one, an obsession with the core processes of solution development, that is, helping the customer understand exactly what's needed. Results management, that is, ensuring the solution gets implemented properly, and relationship management. Two, a business structure that delegates decision making to employees who are close to the customer. Three, management systems that are geared towards creating results for carefully selected and nurtured clients. Four, a culture that embraces specific rather than general solutions and thrives on deep and lasting client relationships. Choosing a value discipline is a fateful event in that it not only commits a company to a single path to achieve greatness, it also purposely destines the company to choose a secondary role in the other disciplines. That's because each discipline requires a company to emphasize different processes, to create different business structures, and to gear management systems differently. For example, when it comes to business structure, the product leader thrives on ad hoc and fluid structure to foster invention and allow resources to be redeployed quickly. Operationally excellent companies, on the other hand, do best with a major brain thrust at central locations where standard operating procedures get refined and decisions are made about acquiring and using capital-intensive assets. A natural organizational structure for the customer intimate company is to move more of the decision-making responsibility out to the boundaries of the organization closer to the customer. Despite the specialization required of market leaders, we regularly come across managers who don't buy the idea of having to narrow their operational focus. What you're saying about having to make hard choices doesn't apply to us, they say. We are good at all three disciplines. Yet, when we look at these managers' businesses, we invariably find companies that don't excel, but are merely mediocre on the three disciplines. Sure, as the ante has risen in their markets, they have improved their cost structure and become more aware of their customers. They have added new products and line extensions over the years. They have kept up with rising parity levels to stay in the game. What they haven't done is create a breakthrough on any one dimension to reach new heights of performance. They have not traveled past competence to reach excellence. To these managers we say that if you decide to play an average game, to dabble in all areas, don't expect to become a market leader. Thus, choosing a discipline is the choice of winners. Not choosing means ending up in a model. It means hybrid operating models that are neither here nor there, and that consequently cause confusion, tension, and loss of energy. It means steering a rudderless ship with no clear way to resolve conflicts or set priorities. Not choosing means setting yourself up to be overtaken by another player that is committed to unmatched value and focused on how to achieve it. Not choosing means letting circumstances control your own destiny. Not choosing means creating managerial complexity that results in you doing business with yourself rather than with your customers. And that's exactly what will set you adrift in the stormy new seas of competition. Chapter 4. The Discipline of Operational Excellence Henry Ford knew about operational excellence. In fact, he practically invented it. The motor mogul built his manufacturing empire around a single notion, efficient production, and infused his whole company with that idea. Today we would call the early Ford Motor Company a paragon of operational excellence, because the founder's business model was tuned to a single purpose, delivering an acceptable product at the lowest possible price. As Ford's costs fell, the retail price of the Model T car fell too, from $850 to $290. Henry Ford's singular focus on achieving efficiency is the same idea that drives operationally excellent market leaders today. These companies, like Walmart and Southwest Airlines, wave one bright banner high above the teeming marketplace, the promise of lowest total cost. Lowest total cost? It can mean lowest price, but it doesn't always. What it does mean is that when all the cost to the customer of owning and using the company's product or service are added up, Costs such as price, time spent at the checkout counter, the inconvenience of untimely repair. Nobody else's deal is likely to be any better. Some of today's operationally excellent companies could teach Henry Ford a thing or two. That's because while Ford focused solely on selling at the lowest price, 
Many operationally excellent companies today focus on multiple tangible and intangible costs. To be sure, price remains the focus of most operationally excellent companies. Price is so low that customers sometimes marvel. How do they do it? Walmart and Price Costco, for instance, continually surprise customers with prices their competitors wouldn't dream of offering. Service companies like Southwest Air and AT&T Universal Card Services similarly prompt customers to wonder, why don't they keep some of that money in their own pockets instead of giving it to us? When operationally excellent companies talk of low or lowest prices, they mean prices that are consistently low. Anybody can hold a fall clearance sale, an anniversary promotion, or a President's Day extravaganza. Operationally excellent companies trumpet their low prices every day, 365 days of the year. When operationally excellent companies boast of their lowest total cost, they may, however, be emphasizing product reliability and durability, which lower customers' future costs of ownership. Toyota ads, for instance, show its products running on and on for 200,000 miles, 300,000 miles, and more. Maytag touts its Rip Van Winkle repairman, whose sleep has been undisturbed for years. Timex used to boast its watches could take a licking and keep on ticking. These companies' customers cherish the dependability they get along with the low price. The prices they paid look lower and lower as the trouble-free years roll on. Another element of cost that operationally excellent companies stress is convenience. The absence of tangible or intangible costs stemming from annoyance and irritation. The strength of these companies lies in the delivery of swift, dependable service. The kind you get from, for instance, 800 flowers which accepts telephone orders from anywhere to ship flowers anywhere. It couldn't be easier or involve less total cost. And Saturn Corp., which may be closer to Henry Ford's idea of a car company than today's Ford, has brought the lowest total cost idea into its showrooms by eliminating one of the chief costs of buying a new car, the confrontation with the salesperson. Furthermore, Saturn's dealer's service delivery system makes the shop visit almost a pleasure. Transactions that are easy, pleasant, quick, accurate, market-leading operationally excellent service companies like Charles Schwab and AT&T Universal Card design the means to achieve that end. Occasional mistakes happen, of course, but operationally excellent market leaders make sure they're so uncommon as to be remarkable. And when mistakes do happen, most recover with such panache that customers are left even more impressed than they would have been had the foul-ups never occurred. But no matter what their formula for combining price, reliability, and hassle-free service to deliver lowest total cost, operationally excellent companies deploy an operating model based on a set of design principles handed down from Henry Ford. Ford's business was highly regimented, proceduralized, rule-driven. There was only one way, the efficient way, to do everything. Complex work was divided into simpler repetitive tasks and combined via the assembly line into an integrated process. The result, efficiency of effort and efficiency of coordination. Current thinking on business re-engineering owes a debt to Henry Ford. He built low-cost, no-frills factories. He aggressively pursued automation to minimize labor and to lower variable costs. The result was that he could design manufacturing processes and work procedures that demolished former standards of cost and performance. Today, standardized assets and efficient operating procedures are the backbone of every operationally excellent company. It's not by accident that all Walmart's doors look alike, that all Southwest Airlines jets are similarly configured 737s, that all J.B. Hunt long-haul trucks are identical, and that all Taco Bell restaurants are as alike as their tacos. Every operationally excellent company that operates over a wide geography has built a network of no-frills, standardized assets that form the basis for efficient operating procedures. But achieving and sustaining operational excellence requires more than cloning hyper-efficient assets. Today, as in Henry Ford's era, variety kills efficiency. Ford maintained a very narrow product line. He didn't introduce a variant of the Model T until millions of units of the basic model had been produced. As for variety and color, he left posterity his legendary remark, any color you want as long as it's black. Operationally excellent companies reject variety because it burdens the business with cost. They produce no-frills products for the middle of the market, where demand is huge and customers are more interested in cost than in choice. Undisciplined companies, on the other hand, let products and services proliferate. They create a variant in response to one customer or operational demand, then create another to fill a different niche. Since they can't be all things to all customers, operationally excellent companies work at shaping their customers' expectations. If price is their strong point, price is what they stress. 
and they make virtues of their apparent limitations. Schwab, for example, crows about not having its own investment research and advisory services. Cut out the biased research and pocket the savings, the company tells customers. Price Costco's product selection is slim, but its prices on category leaders are unbelievably low. Southwest Airlines doesn't offer meals, baggage handling, or advanced seating but it lures short-haul business travelers with its frequent departure schedule and super low prices.